All right. We will continue. I do not have time to go back and review everything in the first hour. The sermon, the message will obviously be posted on the church app, even though I probably shouldn't because I'll get even more emails than I received from last Sunday. But uh, that's okay. Um, at this point, no one likes me, so that's all right. So we'll just continue that trend. All right, we've come up to the point where we have looked at this idea. And remember the phrase, we will review the phrase. What's the phrase we have discovered? Justified by faith? Judged according to works. That is clearly the biblical teaching. This creates a dilemma, all right? Let me read uh, from the Four Views book that I mentioned in the last hour. So here is the basic tension we have uncovered. The Bible teaches that people are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and yet will be judged according to their works. Are we to conclude then that the Bible has created for itself an intolerable impasse? Or should we resort to prioritizing doctrines? Stop right there. What do they mean by, pri- by uh, prioritizing doctrines? Right. So, in other words, what we typically do is we emphasize justification and not try to worry about this whole judgment thing and try to reconcile it. We, we almost teach them as two separate things. And then when we do our little evangelical evangelism, we literally deny what the Bible teaches in regards to judgment. Hey, you know, how are you going to get to heaven? Well, I believe in Jesus. Okay. Well, that's, the Bible says you're going to be judged according to your works. You've got to reconcile. You've got to do more than that. You can't just prioritize one over the other. In particular, they go on to say, for the believer, what role do works play at judgment? For the believer, what, what role does works play? Do they play any? We're going to have to figure this out. So we mentioned a number of names that we're going to look at, starting with Luther. We're going to look at Luther. We're going to look at the New Perspective. We're going to look at John Piper. We're going to look at N.T. Wright. And we're going to kind of get a very, 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 very brief summary of kind of what has happened from Luther and gets us kind of close to the modern times. Then we're going to look at four views from four different authors that are far more modern to try to get us what's going on, what is happening, and how do we reconcile this problem. Again, what's the issue? Justified by faith? Judged according to works. That's the dilemma. That's the tension. All right. Let's start with Luther. All right. The book states it this way. Space precludes even the briefest of sketches of church history on this topic. I agree. If you're going to do a a survey or even a brief sketch on this subject in church history, it would require volumes of trying to figure out what people are saying. They go, but we should at least consider Martin Luther. All right. Luther rejected the Catholic notion of works being meritorious for salvation slash eternal life. Now, let's stop right here. Luther, the Catholic Church, had a system dealing with this. Okay, we're justified this way. We have a judgment according to works. How do we reconcile this? They had a system. Luther said, no. It's wrong. Right now, just because he said it wrong, he still has to find a way to what reconcile this. So, what does he do? All right. So he rejected the Catholic notion. Um, even now, he rejected it, even though the Catholic Church said uh, that um, works um, are preceded by grace. Even though the Catholic Church makes it very clear grace precedes good works, he still rejected their idea, insisting. This is what Luther insisted. That justification was entirely by faith alone. What's the Latin phrase? Sola fide. Apart from works. Luther argued justification by faith alone apart from works. Please note, Luther argued that. Now, why weren't people teaching that prior to Luther? Now, according to most Protestants, they were. We just don't know who they were. Or they were hidden in some little small somewhere, and we don't have any real record of them. But someone was. Right? Well, that's a hard position to teach, but okay. Luther rejects this idea, all right? the, the Catholic idea. He goes on to say, this is the true and chief article of Christian doctrine. The, the, according to Luther, the true and chief article of doctrine is justification by faith alone apart from works. That's his whole foundation. And, listen, 
this idea that we're saved by faith alone apart from works, is irreversible continuing until the final judgment. Stop. If it continues to the final judgment, and we're saved by faith alone apart from works, then what shouldn't show up at judgment? What should be the basis of your judgment? Faith. What should not be the basis of your judgment? What does the Bible say? All right, we got to come up with a solution here. All right, let's see what they go. However, Rome was not Luther's only opponent. <laughs> I wonder why. I wonder why, Luther. You reject the authority, everyone becomes an authority. So guess what? It didn't take long for people to say, Luther, you're wrong. <laughs> okay. Don't you love how that works? Thank you for getting us away from the Catholic Church. Now we can tell you you're wrong and we're right. Who was the other side? You got the Catholic side, you got Luther, and then who was the other side? Okay. Starts with an A. Antinomians. Antinomians. Now, does everybody know what antinomians re reference or what it means? Against the law. All right? They downplayed works altogether. You don't need works. You don't need them. Oh, wait, wait, we got, we need them? Luther's kind of like, well, I mean, we're saved by grace alone through faith alone. He's gonna, it sounds like he's going to be the antinomian, right? But then the antinomians come along, and then Luther's going to come back and try to correct the antinomians. <laughs> Now, this is all early on in, during the Protestant Reformation. We, and now, why is these problems existing? Why don't they just do this? Just read the Bible. Shouldn't it fix the problem? Right, let's see what happens. Thus, Luther insisted, now listen carefully, Luther insisted that while works do not justify, they are important for faith. They're, they're not, they're, they do not justify, but they're important for faith. Now, what are they important for? Come on, what do you think Luther says? Someone can get an A right here. There we go. He says they're important for faith to demonstrate that faith is real. They're important to demonstrate that faith is real. Now, please note, that sounds good, but doesn't seem to be going against sola fide. What should matter? Your faith. He is now saying, okay, wait, wait, okay, we got to do with these works. We got to deal with works. Okay, so this is how it works. Bobby, do you have faith? All right. I need to see your works. Well, here's my works. You're not saved. Well, then... Is that salvation by faith alone, apart from works? You see how, like, we say, you're sick. This is how we, this is how we, 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 this is how Christian, to me, Christianity plays a bait and switch game, right? Hey, do you want to go to hell? Bobby says, no, you're a sinner. Do you know that? Yeah, all right. You know, believe in Jesus and you shall be saved. All right, all right. I see him three weeks later, walking down the road, Smoking a joint, carrying a 40, right? And I'm like, hey, Bobby, whoa, 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 wait a minute, man. Wait a minute, man. You're a Christian. You can't be doing this. Well, you said I just need to believe in Jesus. <laughs> doesn't quite work out that way, man. Now, here's your rules. Well, what if I don't follow the rules? You're going to hell. Well, wait. Am I saved by faith? You are. But if your faith is real, you'll do works. Mm -hmm. Right, but the, but the issue is if those things are required, you're making works a part of it. Either they're there, they have to be there or they don't have to be there. Right, and if you don't want to do it, <laughs> then you're not saved, right, which means you have to. You don't have a choice. <laughs> you don't have a choice, right? Agreed? And you say, well, well you'll, you'll want to do it. Really? Really? 
Everyone here wants to do right. I mean, we could, we could do a test right now, right? If, if, if works is the test, how many are ready to do a test today? Would everyone say that between Monday and Sunday that you demonstrated by how you live that the word of God is the most important thing to you? You treasure the word of God more than money and more than food. Who can pass that test this morning? What, aren't they the evidence? You see how the test game play? Remember, we've done, we've talked about how the test game play. The test game sounds good until you actually take <laughs> the test. It's like, well, y'all, they prove it. Oh, wait a minute. And then who gets to exercise the test? And if, the, and if, if it's going to be, that's going to be the test, and you're going to be judged according to that test, can you have assurance today? No way you can have assurance today because you'd have to wait until you pass the test to know if you're getting into heaven. Which then goes against the whole idea that we can have assurance. Is my assurance based on what Christ did or is my assurance based on what I'm doing? Remember, that was my my issue. Remember, that's why we... Now, I want to make sure we realize when I started challenging the lordship position, I did not realize that we had messed ourselves over. We basically kicked down the pillar that was going to help us get around the judgment according to works. And now we're going to try to erect that pillar back because that's going to be the only way we're going to try to help ourselves. All right, but we'll see what happens here, right? So, he, so what's Luther's argument? But you do need works because works demonstrate that your faith is real. Now, let's continue to how Luther wraps himself up. It's like, he, 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 just, he turns into a pretzel here trying to go back and forth trying to work this out. Because he, he understands he's got to have faith alone, right? I mean, that's his whole argument. But man, these antinomians, they can't be, right? But I don't want to be a Catholic. What am I? All right, so listen what he does. Thus, if good works do not follow, it is certain that the, that the faith in Christ does not dwell in our heart. All right, so if you don't have the works, then you're not really saved. Well, wait a minute. That sounds like what? Works. Okay. Luther wrestles with this tension between faith and works, but is careful to give priority to faith. All right. He realizes there's a tension, so what does he do? Faith gets the priority. Because right. I gotta, I, I'll put faith first and just kind of put this work stuff second. Works are necessary, but they do not make a person a Christian. That sounds good, right? Hey, I'm not saying works make me a Christian. Okay, if you're saying they don't make me a Christian, then what do I then what do I not need? Works. And if you say no, but you do, then you're telling me they are either they are or they aren't. Do you understand? You we we try to play all kinds of word games, and when we get pushed, we don't like it, but we, we have to deal with this. For instance, this is what he says to be without works at the final judgment would be a cause for fear. Now, please, it'd be a cause for fear. Now, he's not going to say that you're not going to be saved because he wants you to have sola fide. So now, but he said there were in evidence. But now, even if you don't have the evidence, you're gonna, you have something to be afraid of. But he's not going to say that you're not going to be saved. What, which is it, Luther? And all that, you got Luther's whole idea is that when you sprinkle a baby at eight days, they become a Christian. Well, Luther's all over the place. Right? Okay. He goes on. However, <laughs> note the however. However, like, okay, if you don't have works, you have something to fear. However, works by themselves will not alleviate fear. If you have the works, that won't alleviate the fear because you can't just have works alone. Now, I agree you can't have works alone. I think everyone agrees with that. Even Catholics agree with that. All right? Will not alleviate fear since salvation is a free gift grounded in God's forgiving grace. So yes, works are important, but if one were to appear at the final judgment without works. So now he's going to use this hypothetical. All right, Bobby shows up to judgment. He has no works. He's got nothing. He's got nothing, right? He never never put down the, the joint, never put down the 40. He just kept doing what he wanted to do, right? This is what he says, and I quote, We cannot tell anyone in such a situation to do anything else than to believe. If you have no works, 
then do not be without faith. Now, wait a minute. He said it's an evidence, but now he's trying to argue that if you don't have the evidence, just make sure you believe. Well, is that going to be enough? If it's an evidence, then that's not enough. Be scared, but believe. Is that an answer? Yeah, it, it, it's, it doesn't work. All right, so now let's jump to the new perspective. There's Luther. How would we sum, summarize Luther's perspective? You're saved by grace alone through faith alone. However, you need works as an evidence, but if you don't have the evidence, just make sure you believe. I don't know how you... <laughs> I don't even know what that is. I don't know what that means. Just, just I don't know. I, it's just, yeah, it's, it's just, because he realizes there's a problem here. He doesn't want to agree with the antinomians. He doesn't want to agree with the Catholics, and he's in no man's land. And again, guess what? The antinomians can quote scripture. Luther can quote scripture. Catholics can quote scripture. What does the new perspective do? All right, here we go. Fast forwarding to the later half of the 20th century. Many have sought to reconcile the juxtaposing themes of justification by faith and judgment according to works. Please note that. What has happened since Luther? Many have sought to reconcile this problem. Agreed? Okay, if you don't know that, many have tried to reconcile this problem. You may think it's already been reconciled. <laughs> no, it hasn't. Okay. All right. Invariably, these studies have focused on... Who do you think these studies have focused on when they're trying to reconcile this problem? Paul, exactly. Why? Because we're studying the book of... That's why we're doing this, right? We got to Romans 2, 6, and we're like, wait a minute, we're judged according to our works. But Paul later is going to make it sound like we don't need our works. So Paul, so th- whenever you start trying to fix this, who do you turn to? Paul. So that's what happens. All right. For, if there, for it is there that we see the contrast more starkly. Now, here's the name of the famous book. You ready? Paul and Palestinian Judaism. That's the name of the famous book. Paul and and Palestinian Judaism. And I'm sure everyone here has read it, and you're all experts in it. Okay, probably not. Does anybody know when it was published? 1977. 1970. Way before we get to the big controversy over the new perspective. All right. It's by E.P. Sanders. Again, Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Now, this book is important because it marked a new era in Pauline studies. This changed the way we view Paul. Now, the average Christian doesn't even know the book exists. The average Christian doesn't even know what happened. And again, this, this, I, I, I want to just stress this. This is the weird thing. Like, I don't know how you, rec- I don't know how you merge the two worlds, right? Someone's got to be reading these books and knowing what's going on, right? Yes? And someone's got to try to bring that to you. If I bring it to you, then it becomes very academic. And some people don't want church to be academic. I don't know how you merge the two. Right? I, I, I've yet to try to figure out the best way. But you need to know about this book. So far, so good? Okay. All right. I'm trying to make as fast as I can. All right. Now, this, now this, I want to make sure you get this down. In this book, it is argued that Judaism was not, in fact, characterized by works righteousness. Now, if you don't understand the significance of that, you should be absolutely shocked. You should, I should hear a, 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 an audible, <gasps> if the book is right, your entire understanding of Romans and Galatians has been wrong. By works righteousness. righteousness. Yeah, works righteousness. In other words, salvation by works. Now, this is what this book says. So this book comes out arguing that Judaism was not, in fact, characterized by works righteousness, as Martin Luther and most of us have thought from our readings of Romans and Galatians. Sanders' work inevitably spawned a flurry of literature on Paul and what came to be known as the New Perspective. One book sparked it, and then everybody started writing books, going, okay, we gotta, we got to relook at Paul. Now, if we relook at Paul, now, I want to make sure you understand this. That changes your hermeneutic. 
You have to, and remember, you believe in sola scriptura. You're the one who has to know the hermeneutical changes. It's not me. You're saying, no, it's your job, pastor. No, it's not. Not in our system. Unless you're going to rely on me. And if you rely on me, then you're relying on a source, an authority. And, and, and again, you would only rely on that authority until I say something crazy. If I came in here and say, hey, Judaism did not teach works righteousness, you would look at me like, you're wrong, pastor. Look at Galatians. Look at Romans. You're wrong. Am I wrong or did you read it wrong? This book argues we read it wrong. Since the new perspective impinges on the role of works at the final judgment, much of what has been written has also addressed this issue in relation to Paul's doctrine of justification by faith. Are you ready? Nevertheless, the last century still brought with it no coherent thought on the subject. Our century, no, no coherent thought. This is hilarious, and what happens? Anybody know the InterVarsity Press uh, Bible Dictionary? I think we've had some in the library before. The InterVarsity Press Bible Dictionary. This is hilarious, and what happens in the InterVarsity Press Bible Dictionary? You ready? Let me read. The InterVarsity Press Bible Dictionaries that came out in the last decade of the 20th century and have as their subtitle a compendium of contemporary biblical scholarship confirm this point. All you have to do is look at the 1992 and 1993 volumes. Stephen Travis argued that at the final judgment, works provide evidence as to whether the basic direction of one's life has been towards God. That's the 1992 and 1993 volume, right? What does that sound like? Works, there's an evidence. Everybody got that? But according to Mark Seffrid in the 1997 volume, right now, 1992 to 1993, now we jump to 1997, and guess what the dictionary is going to do? They're going to change. But according to the, the 1997 volume, works cannot be reduced to mere evidence. Rather, just recompense best describes a judgment that is in accordance with each person's works. What? <laughs> Payment. You work, you get heaven. You don't. Now, what, what changed in the dictionary? He said, well, I don't need any dictionary. I can figure it out myself. Okay, well, I'm, 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 I'll, please bring your paper tonight, and I'll be more than happy to read your paper on the subject. I'll be more than happy. I mean, I'm I'm not joking. I'll go through your argument. Probably nobody here is going to sit down and write a paper on this subject. Joel, you got something to do this afternoon? All right. (laughs) Okay. He came up with something really quick, right? Right. Everybody got that? that? That's a major statement. Now, this does not deny, now this is what they go on to say, this does not deny justification by grace, since believers must not presume upon grace For where saving realities are present, they manifest themselves in preserving faith and obedience, which secure the believer in the final judgment. That's that's very Catholic. That's almost arguing for two justifications. The one we start with, grace, and the one we end with, works. That's, that's, That's in the InterVarsity Press Dictionary. And remember, the average Christian who goes and reads that, do they know what's happened? Do they have any context going, oh, there's this book written in 1977, and there's been... You don't have a clue what's going on. Admittedly, this is a simplified portrayal of things. The reality is that while there are a limited number of ways of explaining the role of works at the judgment, there are many nuances... Other view, others view the final judgment as the place where divine con- commendation will be given or withheld. Either way, the believer is saved. All right, now stop right here. This is the argument that, yes, there's going to be a, a judgment on your works, right? But if your works all burn up, 1 Corinthians 3, you're still going to be saved. And they, they then prioritize 1 Corinthians 3 over all the other verses. 
but you can't ignore the other verses. Because this makes judgment according to works to have nothing to do with heaven or hell. This has judgment according to works to have everything to do with reward. But did John 5, did all those other verses identify that? No. Heaven or hell was based off what? Works. How do you reconcile this? All right. Okay. And then, of course, they they argue, the people who, who emphasize 1 Corinthians 3, they argue Romans 2 is hypothetical. Remember we talked about that view? Well, Paul doesn't really mean we're going to be judged according to our works. I want to make this very clear. Even if you're able to argue that Paul is not arguing for a works judgment in Romans 2, that doesn't get you off the hook. How many other verses did we look at that teaches you're judged according to your... That's the universal teaching of the Bible. What difference does it make to throw out Romans? I throw out Romans 2, I'm good. No, you're not. I got to deal with Jesus. He taught that. So I don't even know why you would come up with the hypothetical view of Romans 2. I don't even know, like, what do you accomplish? All you're trying to do is like, well, then Paul's not going to contradict himself. Okay, Paul doesn't contradict himself, but he contradicts Jesus. (laughs) Is that a better place to be in? Paul doesn't contradict himself, but he contradicts Jesus, and I'm okay. Get me out by noon, and I'll go home and have supper, or lunch, or dinner, or breakfast, or whatever time of day it is. Right? Doesn't make any sense. Now, For others, while rewards and not eternal life is the issue, believers will not be at the final judgment. Others argue believers will not be at the final judgment. We're not even there. Well, wait a minute, then who's going to go to heaven in the final judgment? Remember, because it says some will go to heaven and some will go to hell. Well, then who's going to heaven in the final judgment? Not believers? (laughs) So now we have non-believers who can get into heaven solely based off their works? Well, that's a, a, a crazy place to be, all right? Now, let's jump to Piper and N.T. Wright. Let's jump to Piper and N.T. Wright. However, many of these debates have occurred in scholarly journals and monographs. This doesn't mean they're not accessible. All right, please note that he's making the argument like I make. Don't make some uh, excuse that, well, I, I couldn't keep up with these debates. Yeah, you could. They were accessible, especially with the Internet. All right. But... I know the reality is the average Christian can't read all of this. I don't know how, I don't know how you're supposed to navigate it. I, I, I still don't have the answer because you end up with two classes of Christians. Those who, do, who know and those who don't. And those who don't, I guess, in some ways you're better off by not knowing. Just live in complete ignorance. But other, some of us who do know, we realize that's, that's a problem. I don't know how to, how to work it. But generally speaking, this has remained in scholarly circles. Yet, as one of my former students, now a pastor, said when hearing about this book, this is not a scholarly debate. To get this wrong is serious. Indeed, true, uh, indeed, true blogs are undoubtedly making a difference, yet most Christians I know are completely unaware of the issues. Now, that's what I said. This was the, the topic on blogs forever, right? Um, and, but I want to make sure you understand, his friend who's a pastor is like, hey, this is not a scholarly debate. This is serious. This is talking about judgment. This is not like you can just go, well, I'll let the theologians figure it out. You should figure this out. Yes, no? All right. However, two prominent figures in evangelicalism have brought these issues out into the open in recent years. I am referring to British New Testament scholar N.T. Wright and American pastor John Piper. While the role of works at the final judgment was not the main point of disagreement between the two, it was indeed a major one. So these two are going to have a problem. What's their debate over? The new perspectivism. However, they're going to deal with this idea about works at the final judgment because this becomes on how you read Paul, how we understand the Old Testament, how we understand Judaism, how do we understand Paul. This becomes a major issue. This, this This gives you a whole new system of hermeneutics. The problem was that Wright was one of the leading proponents of the new perspective. Kept on saying, or at least we all thought he did, that at the final judgment, the believer's final justification will be on the basis of the whole life lived. That's what everyone understood N.T. Wright to be saying. Your judgment's going to be based off what? On the basis of the whole life lived. That God's going to look at your whole life and go... Not saved. 
Now, N.T. Wright is in the evangelical world. Now, I know what you're going to say. He's wrong. He's a Bible scholar, but you believe he's wrong. What gives you the authority to say he's wrong? I understand the Bible. Yeah, better than a Bible scholar. That's pretty good. Where did y'all learn that? Where did y'all learn that? Well, yeah, I mean, you can't compare the Muslim faith. I mean, this would obviously require belief in Jesus, and they don't believe Jesus. Right. Right, well, I'm, it's the basis of most religions. Yeah, there's a workspace. But Christianity always claims that we don't believe in a workspace system because we, we don't believe in a religion. We believe in a relationship. And what's going to be the basis of your judgment? Your relationship. That's what we claim. Do you believe in Jesus? N.T. Wright is understood to be saying, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Not the same, right? Everybody got that? Okay. <clears throat> now, again, that's what we thought N.T. Wright was saying. There's going to be some argument where N.T. Wright tries to correct this, and this just lends into like a never-ending debate, but okay, we'll see that. Because N.T. Wright is like, well, I've got to say it that way. Okay, well, I can't say it that way. I've got to say it. Well, no, I can't say it that way. N.T. Wright's trying to figure out how to, why is this so difficult for him to figure out how to say it? What do we have in the Bible? Justified by faith. Right. That's not the Bible. So these people, you can't just say, well, they just don't know what they're talking about. They understand that there's a dilemma here. Right? They're trying to figure this out. All right. Um, now, again, they said, so simply put, justification at the last, please note, at the last, note that, that emphasis, justification at the last, the, this is a Catholic uh, thing. Two justifications. Right? Justification at the last will be on the basis of performance. Well, N.T. Wright, what are you doing? Right? So who comes, t- who comes into the rescue? Dun, 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 dun! John Piper comes into the rescue. Right? Now, if you're a Piper fan, guess who's right? If you're an N.T. Wright fan, guess who's right? Guess what you're not going to do? Not going to study the Bible to figure it out. You're going to rely on what they tell you the Bible says and then go with whichever book you believe is to be right, which ultimately makes who the authority? You. Okay. Yes. That, that's, I'm just calling it like it is. You can't argue that, I, that I'm wrong because you know that's exactly how it works. Right? Piper t- tackled right head on in the future of justification, a response to N.T. Wright. That's the name of the book. Um, the future of justification, a response to anti-right. Please note, the future of justification. He's arguing that the whole idea of justification is being changed and we've got to fight for how we're going to understand it going forward. Now, can, here's the thing. Is it wrong for a Protestant to change the teaching on justification? You cannot say it's wrong. What do they simply need? A biblical justification to change it. Do we have a regular fide that says this is what we have to believe about justification? You could have one in a church, but someone could argue that the church is wrong and then go start a new view on justification. That's, I just want to make sure you understand that, that problem. One of Piper, uh, Piper's central concerns was that Wright makes startling statements to the effect that our future justification will be on the basis of works. Oh, no. That, that doesn't sound good, does it? Piper believed that our deeds will be the public evidence brought forth in Christ's courtroom to demonstrate that our faith is real. Now, that sounds so good, doesn't it? Okay, we're going to be in a courtroom. We're getting ready to be judged. And and then someone's going to bring the evidence. Here's the evidence, everyone. All right, here's the evidence to prove that Bobby Pierce is saved. And everybody, there's a part of everyone here says, well, that sounds good. Are you sure? How much evidence needs to be brought into the courtroom to prove that Bobby is saved? Does anybody know? You can say, well, I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, he tried, he cared. Okay. I guess that's good enough. So, does motive matter? How about the secret things in his heart? Because Jesus went all in that it's not just your actions. Now, 
Is this just going to be the public things Bobby did? What about the private things Bobby did? I don't know if I want to be in that courtroom. Oh, y'all all look all so judgmental. I don't want to be in the courtroom with you either, okay? Probably some messed up things are going to come out. Now, he, he argues our deeds are not the basis of our salvation. They are the evidence of our salvation. Again, everyone just acts like that solves the problem. They're not the basis. They're the evidence. Okay, let me make sure we, we, we go through the circle again. If they are the evidence, they have to be there. And if they're not there, I'm not saved. So simply arguing basis versus evidence, we seem to think, well, I'm not claiming it's the basis. It's just the evidence. And okay, Piper, if I don't have them, what happens in that courtroom? Well, you were not saved. But I thought I was saved. It doesn't matter what you think. But I believed in Jesus. (laughs) Not good enough. Wait a minute. That makes it the (laughs) basis. <laughs> Do you understand? Like, no matter how you work around it, you're making it the basis. That's not a good thing. I understand what Piper was trying to do, but all right. He goes, uh, they are not the foundation. They are the demonstration. Well, that sounds good. That's good preacher talk. Ooh, they rhyme. You can, that's what you always have to do in your sermon, right? All our salvation will be by grace through faith. So when Paul says, that each will be recompensed according to what he has done, he not only means that our reward will accord with our deeds, but also our salvation will accord with our deeds. Now, wait a minute. (laughs) Piper, if they're going to accord with our deeds, you're seeming to make it sound like that they are the bases. And he's going to argue that's not the case. All right. Let's go to the next paragraph. Right? We at least try to finish this, and then tonight we can dig into the first view. So what was Piper's beef with Wright? So what, what was Piper upset with, with Wright? Because in some ways it sounds like they're saying the same thing, doesn't it? Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, Luther tried the same thing. Right? Well, it is, but it isn't. It can, but no, I, I don't know. Right. Actually, it was more that Wright was simply ambiguous on the issue of faith alone. That's what... He, he felt that Piper was too ambiguous on the subject. Right? He, wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't clear on it. Leaving the door open, listen, this is what Piper's concerned with, that Wright left the door open for, drum roll please, a Catholic interpretation. Anathema. That can't happen. So, if that can't happen then you're left with very few options in how to reconcile the two. Everybody agree? Yeah, everyone should agree. You're left with very few options in how to deal with it. All right. According to Piper, it may be that right means nothing more than what I mean when I say that our good works are the necessary evidence of faith in Christ at the last day. Perhaps, but it is not so simple. Thus, I would be happy, wrote Piper, for Wright to clarify for his reading public that this is, in fact, not what he believes. So Piper was like, look, man, you, he needs, uh, Wright's got to clarify this. He's got he's to help us here. He's got he's to make this clear because I, I don't understand what's going on. Piper, as we have seen, does not have a problem with judgment even, and even with works being necessary for one's final salvation. Please hear that. Piper does not have a problem with judgment and even with works being necessary for one's final salvation. He just doesn't want it to be the basis. But again, I still don't understand the game we're playing. It's not the basis, but it's necessary. If it's necessary, doesn't that become the basis? Like, do you see how... And I want you to understand this. All this was happening... In the last 15 years, 20 years of Christianity, you were all Christians and you didn't even know this was going on. You didn't even know. Now, some of us who are watching all of this was like, what in the world? Okay, do I go with this side? Wait, do I go with this side? Wait, what what do I do? 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 And then everybody was taking sides. I bet you there were church splits. I can almost guarantee you there were church splits. 
His central concern was that for right, the ultimate basis or ground of final, final salvation appeared to be works rather than faith alone in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. No, they're arguing, what's the word they're arguing over? Bases. Piper doesn't want it to be the basis, but he wants it to be necessary. So if it's necessary, it's not the basis. But you... Now, do, this is what I want. Do you see how nuanced this argument is? Do you see how nuanced? Now, here's the thing. Are you equipped to handle with these nuances? I don't think the average Christian is equipped to handle with these nuances. I don't know if I'm equipped to handle with these nuances. I don't know who's equipped to handle with these nuances. It's your responsibility to understand what's happening, right? Because if you go into a church, you've got to know what, what do you believe. Now, I know that the average church, they don't even know what they believe. They're like, well, save by grace alone through faith alone. Just believe in Jesus. You're good. Right? That's how they talk around here, right? right? Just believe in Jesus. You're good. All right. Amen. Okay. And we'll have a potluck at 1230. Don't worry about it. It's theology stuff. You're good to go. Okay? We'll have a church picnic on the 4th of July. Right? You're good. And everybody's like, amen. Well, in the meantime, what's happening? Christianity is being redefined, and we don't even know what's, what's happening. And many of those churches, I wish we could just like live in a little bubble of ignorance, but you can't. This stuff is important. All right? So let's see what they go on here. All right? For Piper, Christians are free from law-keeping. What? Wait, we're free from law-keeping? Now, do you see what's happening to Piper here? Who's he starting to sound like? Luther. All convoluted. Because look what he does here. Christians are free from law-keeping as the ground of our justification. Right? So he doesn't like it to be the ground, but is he going to say that you don't have to keep the law? No, because what is going to be the bait, what is going to be necessary for your salvation at the end? What? I don't understand. If I don't need to keep it, then I can't be judged for not keeping it. I don't understand. <laughs> it's so confusing. Hey, you do not have to keep the law. Okay, Brenda, you don't have to keep the law. And then Linda, oh, Br- Brenda just stops keeping the law. She's just breaking every commandment. Well, you're not saved. Then you have to keep it. <laughs> Do it. Does she or doesn't she? And now you're going to say, well, you, don't, you just have to try. So now we're going to be judged based off the trying or based off the doing? Does the, the Bible say we're going to be judged according to our trying? This is going to be, uh, say, it's going to be uh, based off our motivation. No, according to the Bible, and we looked at every passage, it's going to be judged according to our works. Wright responded, so then Wright comes back, uh, with a book called Justification, God's Plan and Paul's Vision. See, all these books were being written and people were like, ooh, this book, okay, now I'm going to read this book. And then, you, you know, depending, and then I, I remember I questioned a church in Abilene. Oh, it got ugly, it got ugly, 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 ugly. I questioned a church in Abilene going, it was a church, Christ church. And I'm like, do you guys believe in the new perspectivism? That did not go well. They got so mad at me saying that I was being a heresy hunter and I was going to post it on the blog that they believed it and they wouldn't answer me a question. And they, 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 they just, they went, they got furious at me. And I'm like, do you believe in the new perspective? See, well, y'all didn't know what was going on. I was trying to figure even what churches in Abilene believe. And I told everyone here that you can listen to the sermons in Abilene so that you can figure out what was going on. This was, this was happening in your, your, ta- your town. New perspectivism was causing problems in churches in Abilene. Right? But you couldn't ask people because people would get mad. Because if you questioned them on new perspectivism, they knew if you didn't agree agree with their new perspectivism, you were going to blame them for being a heretic. And that's what was happening. If you were the new perspective side, you were the heretic. If you were not the new perspective side, you were a heretic. It was 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 just a, a new kind of fight. Right? He qualified, that so in, in this book, Wright comes back and he's going to try to clarify himself. He qualified that he didn't mean salvation is earned or that a perfect life was required. Now, you don't need a perfect life. Okay, well, all right, that sounds good. 
Oh, I don't need to be perfect. Right? But do I, do I need works? See the, 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 the issue here? What he did mean was that because of our union with Christ, the presence of the Spirit and God's work in us, we are now able to live a new life. And are you ready for this? We are now able to obey the law. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Now, does anyone here believe you are able to obey the law? I hope, if you, now, this is a whole, remember we've talked about this as well. There's not even agreement within Christianity on this. Can you obey Now we, and this church, because we've so prioritized human depravity, we don't believe we can. Other churches who downplay human depravity believe you can. I will just argue, don't, remember, I've always said this to everyone, if you believe that you can, don't argue with me. Just do it. Just do it. And videotape it. And I want the obedience of the law internally and externally I want that video, and then we will have a church service where we watch a movie, the movie of you keeping the law. And it should not be just a minute long. I'd like at least a week worth of material to work with, right? Because we may need to see how you pulled this off, right? He says, uh, so now we're able to live a new life, obey the law, and to put to death the misdeeds of the flesh and to live eternally. We can now do all of this. Isn't that great? Now, he uses Romans to prove all of that. Of course. Of course he does. Hence, humans become become genuinely human, genuinely free when the Spirit is at work within them so that they choose to act. Please note, now we have true freedom. You become a Christian, now you're truly free. You you don't have to sin. Woo, man. I got to look at my life again. In ways which reflect God's image, which gives him pleasure, which brings glory to his name, which do what the law had in mind all along. Well, now we can do what the law had in mind all along. Okay. It does. Sounds very MacArthur-like. But MacArthur would reject the new perspectivism. But this sounds very MacArthur-like. Right? Um, this is the life that leads to the final verdict. Well done, good and faithful servant. So when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, it's well done based off what you have done because you have the ability to do it. This is not to do away with faith, for if God justifies people in the presence ahead of the final judgment, faith must be the characteristic of those justified. So we have to have faith. Sounds good. Please note, final judgment. It's starting to get into this like duality thing again. Wright's response, however, was not enough to stave off his critics. Of course, this didn't work because people had already taken sides, and they're like, ah, right doesn't really mean it, all right? Um, Still ambiguous was the ground of final salvation. Wright and Piper were scheduled to go head-to-head as speakers at the 2010 Evangelical Theological Society's annual meeting in Atlanta. This was going to be, you know, the Thrilla and Manila. This was going to be the fight. The two were going to meet, Everybody had their internet ready to go. We were going to watch live stream it. Woohoo! It's going to be the fight to remember. Of course, I didn't even care, didn't know what was going on, but there were plenty of us going. But what happened? Do you remember what happened at this great event? Piper couldn't make it. <laughs> the pay per view was off. No, the pay per view went on, but this it wasn't a pay per view. I think it may have been a pay per view, probably. Okay, who knows? All right. Um, Piper couldn't make it, and Tom Schreiner, or Schreiner he's, the, he's one of the contributors of this book, took his place. He called for a more thoughtful explanation on the issue. He, he tries to, like, okay, we got to figure this out. He goes, I think what Wright says about justification by works or judgment, according to works, could be explained in a more satisfactory way, since he occasionally describes good works as the final Basis of justification. What's the argument? What word are we back to? Basis. That's the argument. Basis. Basis. I'm trying to make this, uh, I'm trying to give you this history and making it simple for you to understand, right? Where you at least have an idea, right? Okay, we're, we're out of time. We're going to have to stop here. I wanted to try to finish this section. 
On the other hand, right, reminds us of a critical theme that is often ignored in evangelical cir- circles. Listen. So this is this man trying to say, okay, I think, I think our problem here is we, he's saying it's the basis, but let's be fair, Wright did do a good job of reminding us of something, which is often ignore, uh, ignored in evangelical churches. And what did he remind us of? Paul does teach that good works are necessary for justification and for salvation. What? This is on the opposite side of Piper. And now he just said good works are necessary for justification and for salvation. And Wright rightly says that those texts are not just about rewards. Now we're going to have to stop right there. So do do these two sides disagree or do they not disagree? Would you, argue, would you argue that the whole debate is ambiguous at best and confusing? Now, what is the average Christian supposed to do? Now, are these people who, who know the Bible? Yes. Are these people who study the Bible? That's their lives. Are they able to pull up one verse and solve the problem? So does that mean you can? So how do we resolve the issue? Well, we'll have to, continue, we'll have to find out what happened, Right? And then guess what we're going to do? We'll start tonight. We're going to look at four views. Four views. We're going to look at them. We're going to critique them. We're going to tear them apart. And then guess what we're going to try to figure out? Okay, what a good answer is. But do you think we're going to be able to solve the problem? Okay, no way, no way. Now, I know that, that now, see, when I was a young Christian, I would just pick the side, right? Come up with the sermon, come in here and say, hey, here are the four views. That view's wrong, that view's wrong. This is the view that's right. Everybody go home. And you'd be like, amen, that's the view I believe. Okay? But that's learning theology and using theology. Now we're in this part where we have to do what? Do theology. And doing theology requires now we do a lot more questioning to figure this out. This is a key doctrine. This has nothing to do... Again, everybody's going to say, well, this is dealing with Catholicism. This is dealing with your Bible. We did a survey of the Old Testament. We did a survey of the New Testament. Did we not? And what did we discover? Judgment is according to... Justification is... By faith. You have to reconcile those. And and, and what you'll do is you'll quote out... You'll throw out a little slogan going, that fixes it... You really think it fixes it? Because your slogan is going to downplay one of those. Or you're going to do what they, what have many of them tried to do? They're, they're ignoring the circle. Hey, works aren't required, but if you don't have the works, you're not saved, which literally means to say they're not required when making them required is disingenuous, it's a lie, it's not right, it's not fair to the average Christian. And that's what I think is wrong. And I'll end with this. This is what happens in many evangelical churches. And if you are an independent fundamental Baptist, you experience this full-fledged. When when you're witnessed by an uh, an independent fundamental Baptist, they give you the Romans road. They're going to say, you're a sinner. Salvation is in Christ. Believe in him and you're saved. And you're going to be like, amen, I'm saved. And then you join an independent fundamental Baptist church and all of a sudden you realize... You got to do this, 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 you got to do this. And then you start looking, those who don't do that, you start questioning, oh, women who wear pants, I don't know if they're saved. Oh, people who listen to secular music. Well, wait, I thought I was saved. I thought these people were saved by grace alone through faith alone. So now, rated R movies and secular music determines one's salvation? Well, no, you're saved by grace alone through faith alone, but that proves what that proves they're saved. That means they have to have it to be saved. So now the way I know that I'm saved is based off the movies I watch, the clothes I wear, how I talk, how I dress. That makes my salvation based off... Oh, no, it's not bases. Just don't use the word bases. Just use the word evidence. And then I'm off the hook. Do you see how utterly foolish that is? Hey, it's not the bases, so don't worry about it. But you're making it the evidence... Well, if evidence means, what, what is required for evidence? Evidence means it's necessary. Evidence determines guilt. Right? 
or innocence based off evidence. Yeah, I, I, see, I just said based. As long as I can find a way to describe it without using the word basis, then I don't get involved in this controversy. But the controversy is a real controversy that happened within the Protestant world. This is happened in the Protestant. This did not happen in the Catholic world. This is a, a Protestant problem. All right, let's stop right there. Right. Lord God, we come before you this morning. Lord, we've seen the history of this debate. We've seen the struggle with this debate. And now we all leave here ca carrying the same Bible that seems to teach that we are justified by faith, but at the same time, you will judge us according to our works. This is not a theological problem. This is a Christian problem, and everyone who's a Christian should want to know what is the basis for the judgment we will experience, because everyone in this room will face a judgment. I pray you will help us discover the answer in your word, and I pray that we will do everything in our power to think about these positions as logically and carefully as I can. And I pray that everyone here was really dedicated to trying to find the answer. We ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said...